Super. No, thank you so much, Matthew. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. Um, I just want to switch my camera off. Um, let me just do this. Apologies for this. Great, there we go. Well, as I said, many thanks, Matthew. And um, thank you also to everybody who's listening for your time and for your interest in joining us. Um, these museum moments, the events are just such a wonderful way to spread the news about the inspiring museums that we have in this country. And so I really want to thank Strauss and company for realizing this series of presentations. And also, of course, for inviting me to talk about the UCT Boomer Stern Museum. I am passionate about the museum. And so this is a real treat for me to be able to share this passion with you. To tell the truth, Strauss and company had already asked me early last year whether I wanted to present for museum moments, but I had joined the museum only in January 2019 after the retirement of the previous director, the iconic Christopher Peter. And then came COVID, bring such massive changes in our lives. So to be honest, much of my planning was also just sketchy at that stage. And I felt just a bit too overwhelmed to take this on, which makes this an even more special for a moment for me to be talking to you. But whilst the change in um, pace that COVID brought wreaked such so much havoc, it also had positives. It forced me and the museum committee to delve deeply and try really understand what the role of the Irma Stern Museum would and could be during and after COVID. So for all the updates, the closures, the disappointment and loss that COVID brought the Irma Stern team, and for so many of us, the last year did mean that one could not simply go through the notions of some preconceived plan of what a museum is and how it is run and how it addresses its audiences, but rather we felt that we had to do some deep interrogation around values, meaning and communities. And this means that in today's talk, I will not only introduce you to the Ernestone Museum, although I suspect quite a few of you are familiar with this site, but I also want to sketch out a future vision for the space and the projects that we are busy with that we hope will bring us closer to this vision. And when I say we here, I mean the wonderful Irma Stern Museum team, and I always champion them because without them, the museum would not be. So here they are, all seven of them plus me. Let us start with just a quick whirlwind synopsis of how this museum came about. The UCT Irma Stern Museum is part of the UCT University of Cape Town Lower Campus Precinct and consists of the large former home of the artist Irma Stern, including a significant part of the original garden and outhouses. For instance, the old coach house, the old stables, one of which is now an office of mine. The museum houses select works by Irma Stern, as well as a substantial collection of art, cultural artifacts and furniture, which Stern collected throughout her life. An incomplete of origins of these would include ancient Egyptian, ancient Greek, Iberian, Oriental, South American, Central European, and most notably, African. There's a commonly held misunderstanding that Irma Stern left all of this, her collections, her art and the house, in a will to be kept as a museum. In fact, the will states that the house and collections in the house will be given to further the arts in this country. So not necessarily for a museum but rather the implication was that the house would be sold and the collections would be exhibited and used to further the arts. This is quite clearly different to what we have now, which is a museum. And this is where the chance of history comes in. The original chair of trustees appointed to execute Stearns' will, uh, Mr. Clive Corder, happened to also be a member of council at UCT. And it is he who saw the promise of keeping Irma Stearns' house as a museum. And to make this realize, realizable, through linking with the university. This link to UCT is actually not very far-fetched if one looks at Irma's life. She obviously lived at the base of the mountain where the university is for much of her life, but she also married Johannes Prince, who was a professor in German literature at UCT. Her cousin and many other people she socialized with had links with UCT. And we have an account of students coming to her home to discuss art with Irma. So through mutual agreement, UCT purchased the house from the trust for a nominal amount and UCT now owns and maintains the property 
whilst the trust owns and maintain the collections which are housed within this property. This agreement was signed in 1969 and then followed a period of protracted building work and bizarre delays where British postal strike interrupted things. And after two years of waiting, finally, the museum was opened. And I want to show you one of my favorite pictures now, the one from 1971, just a year before the museum opened, and the one from now. And you will see the little banana tree in the corner has now bloomed massively and grown. The UCT Irma Stern Museum is, of course, focused on the life, work, and complexities of the artist Irma Stern who lived here from 1927 until her death in 1966. Just by the by, she did not die in the first, she died at what is now Gardens Medi Clinic, the Folks Hospital. However, I want you to allow me a little brief side detour at this point and to look further back through the looking glass of history. You see, the first was actually not home to just one creative with a fascinating history, but two, two creative powerhouses with fascinating histories. It was also the house of the, at the time renowned architect, John Parker. Now Parker's name has slipped from the memory of all but architectural historians, but his creations still surround us in Cape Town and in the wider South Africa. I want to show you this map of Cape Town. And each red square on this is a building that was designed by John Parker and his architectural practice. And many of these are still extant, so you can see just how prolific he was. And for many Cape Townians, these buildings are still intensely familiar parts of the cityscape. Garlic's building, the Great Synagogue, the Peter Clark Art Center, um, formerly Frank Schubert Art Center, Rustenburg, Weinberg Girls High School, Simonstown High School. That's naming just a few. I can carry on for a long time. Though firmly built in the colonial style, the hallmark of Parks's Cape Gothic, Cape Gothic was still nonetheless hugely influential in shaping and continuing to shape the look of Cape Town. So it was this John Parker who in, 19, in 1898, sorry, let me just repeat that, 1889 bought a single story thatch farmhouse in Rosebank on the slopes of Devil Peak. He was, as said, an architect, but he was older, a father of eight children. So he wasted no time in converting the single story farmhouse he bought into an Edwardian double story mansion or large house. And it is here that he housed his family. It is also here that Irma Stern eventually lived. This is the firs. And I want to show you a slide of the firs as it was just a year before Irma Stern bought it. So the previous one was when Parker had it, this one now. This is when Irma Stern bought the house in 1926, she bought it in 27 and then as it is currently. But just quickly back to Parker, I just also want to mention that he wasn't only a tremendously prolific and important architect and city planner, but also he was a mayor of Cape Town. So a real Renaissance man. So I mentioned that Parker bought the property at the Furs in 1889. Just 10 years later in 1898, Irma Stern would have been a four-year-old running around the small town of Schweizer Renneke in the then Transvaal. Here her father and uncle owned a very profitable business situated on the trading route that serviced the nearby booming mining activities. Stern's life was marked by a complicated dance between continents and culture. The Stern family of German Jewish stock with both Mama and Papa German born spent much time in their birth country so that Irma, in effect, spent the bulk of her younger years not in South Africa, but in Germany. In 1920, however, Irma returned to South Africa and settled in Cape Town, which would be her home base for the rest of her life, but with famous frequent and extensive travels on the African continent and abroad. As was common at the time, Stern lived to appearance in a house that still stands in Breeder Street Gardens. Family relations with Mama and Papa were never easy, with Mr. Stern having no understanding for art, and Mrs. Stern, according to Irma, being ill-tempered and domineering, although it has to be said she did miss her after the mother's passing. There are also indications that the senior Stearns were less than pleased with their inverted comma wallflower daughter. Given the conventions at the time, 
being in the late 20s, then early 30s, and still not married, was considered an embarrassment. Many scholars suggest that this was indeed the parental pressure that led to Irma Stern marrying a Johannes Prince in 1926. The reason why I mentioned the marriage is not because it's and its failed trajectory towards divorce in 1933, finalized in 34, reveal, it's not only that this reveals much about Irma Stern's unconventional character, but more importantly, I mentioned the marriage because it is important to the tale of the UCT Irma Stern Museum. It was a marriage that led to the purchase of the furs and thus led to Irma Stern making it her home for the rest of her life. After the marriage, there was a brief rental stay in Seapoint. Then the um, furs are bought to be a family home for the princess, Johannes and Irma Prince, or as Irma progressively at times signed her name for a while, Irma Stern Prince. I've become quite obsessed with researching what the furs would have looked like when Irma lived here, or indeed when John Parker lived here, and before that, when it was the site of a Dutch farm, and prior to that, Koi grazing grounds. Understanding how Irma and her forebearers lived on the site is an engagement with our deeper social history and in turn helps us to understand not only Irma but that which we consider our culture. By peeling back the layers of history we understand not only our immediate past but the way this past is entwined, complicated and enriched through so many narratives. It is this complicated weave of history that allows us to understand who we are and where our struggles, identities, and ways of being come from. More narrowly though, understanding how Irma Stern lived ultimately helps us approach Stern's work with an appreciation of the context it was produced in. This is also true of the visual appearance of her work. Shall we, if we could look at her daily curation of the paintings. How did Irma live with the art in her home? How would the artworks have looked when she displayed them on the walls of the furs in her own time? The Irma Stern Museum is partly famous for its bright fuchsia wall and for a very bright green wall. We are often asked whether this is how Irma painted these rooms. It was not in fact her, but rather an impression of her exuberant character as interpreted by the previous director, Christopher Peter. As such, the color in these rooms remain untouched, but in other rooms, the ISM team has scraped away the layers of paint, literally scraping away layers of history, it felt like, to see what color Irma would have had when she stayed here. This means that the passage is now returned from an impressionistic, terracotta to the me mellow beige that Irma would have had in her time. So, uh, Irma Stern's team has also made a number of other changes to subtly bring the furs closer to the way it was when Irma lived here. These include almost unobtrusive touches in the studio. For instance, when you next come and visit, look out for the old Irma Stone notebook. The seed packets that we know from description she had littered on her desk a tram ticket, a magazine that was found in her possessions. We are playing now early Baroque music in her studio, just as she did when she painted. And I must tell you, one of my favorite Irma stories is that Dudley, her companion in later life, would ever so often rush into the studio to wind up the gramophone for her. I already mentioned the passage repaint. Now, a bold the intervention that was done at the Furs recently, or well, to tell the truth, still ongoing, <laughs> is to bring the dining room closer to what Irma had when she lived here. Those of you that know the museum will remember an atmospheric dark terracotta red space, deep and moody with religious icons. The icons certainly remain, but extensive scraping back of paint layers on the walls have revealed that the dining room was in fact a slight a sage green. And here is a rather strange photograph of the green, I mean. We also saw from scrapings that the picture rail, what some people call the data rail, was a sort of soda pop green, typical of the period of the 50s and 40s. And prior to that, it was a dark brown, possibly still an Edwardian color left over from John Parker. 
by the way, when John Parker lived here, it seems that one wall color was a very, very dark green wallpaper. And this is where serendipity and fantastic timing came to, to our help. The dining room, room normally houses a number of religious icons, church benches, a Spanish 17th century side table, and most notably of all, a magnificent but massive English hall table. To renovate and rethink this room would thus ordinarily have been a logistical nightmare. But unexpectedly, in 2020, the Rupert Museum requested the loan of the whole dining room, dormer table, church bench, and all. So this was an exciting chance for us to not only share the way Burma lived with a wider audience, and you see on your screen the installation that is currently up at the Rupert Museum, but also to make, uh, the, make much needed space for the work that needed to happen on this room. And so preparations began. The installation and transit of furniture, art, curtains, religious icons, and even the pendant light fitting. Our curator of collections, Kathy Wheeler, sure was busy. I must admit that I choked up somewhat when, um, when the courier company came to collect the furniture. Because imagine this, Irma placed the furniture in this room and it had not left the furs since then. Not since her death in 1966, not after, until now in 2021. And I think that's quite special. So at this stage, you presumably are hoping to see a slide of the sage green walls. I must confess, it is a project very hot off the press and very much still on the go. So we are still busy painting and I'm hoping that you will get a chance to come visit the museum and see the final product in person. And if you do, please do give us a feedback on what you think about the new look of this dining room. I also want to mention that the period of lockdown was no means idle. Um, as soon as we could, we came back to the museum and had um, contractors in that helped us with substantial renovations, for instance, with extensive replacing of the roof. And we installed a new reception area and in, there is a new flow through the museum. One aspect of the museum's collections I'm deeply passionate about is the African collection. We know that Irma Stern collected and was given African art pieces during her travels on this continent. Additionally, she garnered many pieces during her travels in Europe, and indeed, Irma roamed the secondhand shops and flea markets of Cape Town to further augment her collection with pieces she purchased here. One pictures her bustling up and down Long Street. What is remarkable about our current context in South Africa is that it is very easy to view the historical cultural production of Western societies in museums, etc. And it is relatively easy to view and engage with contemporary cultural production of Africa, with galleries celebrating and showing the contemporary art and design of this continent. And yet, it is incredibly difficult to get access to and view historical art from this continent. And here is where this collection of African art within the UCT Irma Stern Museum becomes truly significant. It is a rare chance to see, celebrate, explicate, and discuss the cultural history and production of peoples of our own continent. For a museum that is located in a university that is Africa-centric, we have seen in the museum how this African collection can engender a real sense of pride in students. From visitor feedback, the team identified the recurating of the African collection at the Irma Stern Museum as a priority project. And we coalesced a wonderful group of scholars, students, members of descendant communities, art historians and curators to contribute and um, help formulate an ongoing project of recuration of this collection. This is an unbelievable source of knowledge that we can now, this, this when I say this, the, these contributors are an unbelievable source of knowledge that we can now draw on for an ongoing project of making sure that we contextualize the work and make sure that we understand the relevance of the African collection. So what we have now is a rotating exhibition of smaller selections of African art holdings that regularly get swapped out and which have an emphasis on additional information to help us understand each work, not only for its aesthetic beauty, but also for its cultural relevance and value. Additionally, 
We used one of the spaces in the museum to create a direct dialogue between the work of Irma Stern and the art of the Bakongo people. So the exhibition entitled Ngari Amwash. Now, the Ngari Amwash is sort of the primordial mythical figure of the, um, of the people of the Congo. Um, it's almost the equivalent of what in Christianity would be an Eve. And in this Ngari Amwash exhibition, each African art object speaks directly about the matrilineal line of the Congo and Magbeto kingdoms. What I mean by that is that each object speaks to the status and power of women in these cultures. The bully chief stool, for instance, speaks to how the female is a pillar that holds up and supports the male political power. There's an oracle that speaks to the divination powers of women. The Mangbeto stool, one of if, um, three, speaks about the status of women between each other in society, with the higher ones being for higher status women and the lower ones for lower status women. Also included is a maternity figure, which according to the scholar Alyssa Agama, is a somber reflection on how the slave trade decimates the male population of the region, leading to an acute imbalance between the genders and thus leading to a surge of production of Congo fertility figures. These themes of power and presence of the female are then picked up in the inclusion of Irma Stern's paintings based on her travels in the Central African region on 1942, 46 and 52. I see the museum as a site of dialogue and discussion that does not shy away from difficult questions and is open to hearing multiple voices. In line with this, I wish you to see the museum as a hub of dialogue, of research and information and exploration. We now have a permanent workshop and education room to help us with this, as well as this reading room you see here. On the other hand, exploration and research is also manifested in more subtle integrated ways, such as when we include a tablet in the studio showing how that space looked throughout the decades from the 30s until Stearns' passing in 66 and beyond during the different, Irma of, um, different eras of Irma Stern as a museum. Here is where we are also excited to very soon host a substantial exhibition researched and curated by Michael Godby and exhibited throughout the museum. Michael had a really tough run with this show. It was first meant to be presented under Christopher Peter and then in early 2020. And we all know what happened early 2020 and lockdown. So now finally, this exhibition will open on the 26th of May. And it would be lovely if you are in Cape Town, if you could pop in and visit it. What is so fascinating about this exhibition is precisely the meticulous research that went into putting it together with Godby analyzing the nudes of Irma Stern in relation to specific sub-themes. Though, to be honest, the show is also remarkable for the way it shows the sheer artistic breadth of Stern's approach to her own art. Michael also mined the Irma Stern collection for links between works, showing new insights into how Irma Stern worked with whole sequences where a model was sketched over and over again within one studio setting, or where a preliminary sketch clearly influences a final oil painting. Equally exciting about the show is the inclusion of some remarkable loan work and some seldom seen work, even in some cases, work that has never been exhibited before. So he really went digging through our drawers and to, to find those things that had never seen the light of day in an exhibition. I know that Michael handled the final draft of the substantial exhibition catalog to the printers on Monday. So that was, what are we now? We are on a Wednesday, so two days ago, it went off to the printers. And I say, I cannot see, wait to see the final form of this catalog, but also the final form of the exhibition, which will be exhibited throughout most of the spaces of the furs and often in relation to Irma Stearns' furniture. I'm also really looking forward to a series of practical workshops linked to the exhibition, which explore the topic of the body through both drawing and move me, movement. I'm speaking of research, of artistic analysis and of art history. 
we must of course realize that this is a rarefied world. So, so many South Africans will never have had any encouragement to engage with art, never mind art history or art analysis. I think that we all realize that for the arts to thrive in this country, we need to engender a greater love for art in a new and wider community. It is crucial to address this issue. It is not an easy task, not something that happens overnight, but we have already seen an encouraging diversification in the people that managed to engage with the museum. A main driver in this has been the school-focused education program, but Aisha Price will talk to that in depth just now, so I will leave that to her. Additional to the education program, we place strong emphasis on linking to the University of Cape Town. And this is partly through the academic program, contributing to lectures, hosting lectures. But the idea additional is an even simpler one. The UCT Amistern Museum is surrounded by student residencies. There's literally a population of thousands of students living within walking distance of the museum. Now, of course, many of these students are not really museum goers. It would never enter their mind to choose to go to a museum. But what the UCT Irma Stern Museum also has is a wonderful ambiance, superb rooms, and a magnificent large garden. With these in mind, we have embarked on promoting the museum and promoting the art and life of Irma Stern through these other aspects of the museum. This means that we now encourage students and visitors to bring their picnic to linger on the lawns, to bring books to read, to have a cup of coffee or tea seated at outdoor tables. And the other day I half jokingly said to somebody that I get excited every time a visitor comes and experiences the museum, but I get 10 times more excited when a student comes just to spend time in the garden or indeed anybody other than a student, any other visitor comes to spend time in the garden. And the reason I get so 10 times more excited is that I know that many of the students and many of the other visitors that would come just to enjoy the garden would in no way be familiar with museums and that this could be their first step towards a possible long path, path to discover art, museums, and the inspiration they can give us. I have said this is true also of many other visitors, not just of, as of students, and an emphasis has actually become venue higher at the museum site. At, in this year alone, we have posted a memorial in the garden, a birthday on the veranda, beam building in upstairs spaces, a TEDx UCT talk, cocktail events, film shoots, and lunches. So often the, in, in these events, the comments come from attendees that they would never normally visit a museum, that they feel intimidated and alienated by that thought. But similarly, so often the comments, comment comes afterwards that the relaxed ambiance of the house museum and the emphasis we place on the social means that they will definitely come back. And so we slowly grow exposure to the arts and museum and the inspiration they can bring to a wider audience. And on that note, I now want to hand it over to Aisha Price, our interim curator and the powerhouse between the UCT Emerson Education Program. But Aisha, before you start, I want to just thank Strauss and Company for their very generous support of the Museums as Teacher Training Program. You will hear from Aisha about that and just how important it is in our con current context. So many thanks to Strauss and Company for that support. Aisha? Over to you. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the activities within um, the museum and the kind of um, education programs that we have been running. All right. All right, um, this first image that I'm going to show you is one from uh, the early 2010s, um, showing the kind of vibrancy that the museum has and always can offer. But largely and most importantly, 
when it comes to the work that is integral to the museum or to any museum, among those are basically understanding what it means to be human. How do we belong? How are we understood? How do we gain insight into our communities and share our stories? How do we read history? Integral to the work of the museum is the creation of opportunities to make sense of the human experience and condition. And to work with precious human material is a great responsibility that all museums bear. It is a noble task, but it is a very humbling one. Now, within the context of the disparate conditions in which our people live, and when I speak about our people, I speak about our visitor constituency. Um, within this context of, of these conditions, opportunities for the sharing of our vastly different knowledges in a very meaningful way, uh, in a non-threatening space, and in the language that comes easiest to you is a very difficult task. It requires collaboration and consultation across many levels. It requires conversations, sometimes hard conversations, that get us to learn, experience, make, debate, and engage. Conversations that create shared experiences and new histories. Conversations that bring change. This task requires careful consideration of what we do and how we do it so that we can build a future audience for the museum, for the work of Irma Stern, for the arts and art history in general. Um, now, when we look at this happy group of, of young people who are visiting the museum for the first time, uh, feeling welcomed and free um, in this home of the, one of the most prolific artists that South Africa has ever produced. And we juxtapose it with a picture of one of our classes from 2020. Um, I have to say that 2020 was really a great learning curve um, as a seasoned museum and art educator because all of our interaction happened remotely. Uh, this image um, is from one of our online classes in 2020 when um, we started to support the metrics that had to finish their schooling year off um, during the pandemic. Irma Stern plays an incredibly strong role uh, within the South African visual arts curriculum. Um, and this program was really invaluable to us uh, as it made the struggles of the post-2020 learning community very apparent. And it required us to reevaluate what we do and how we do it digitally so that we could get conversations around art rolling uh, and present within our digital classes and our digital interactions. Um, from how we incite observations from a very new audience with very basic literacy levels to how we could encourage and develop research-based work. Now with digital tuition and the now sterile classroom, the sensory experience was totally located um, in the sequence of the visual images projected on a very flat surface and the intonation and the phrasing of the televised instructor. The printed material was the only tactile element, but of course worksheets, brochures, catalogs and books have always served very well as a resource material. Uh, and for these classes, we started to develop um, the kind of material that would be relevant to the study of Irma Stern, her role in society, uh, the student's role in society, uh, and the role of art within all of this. Um, but also, uh, we couldn't just leave it with uh, focusing on single schools, single classrooms, and offering these online activities in that way. So what we did, um, was we started our website development um, early last year. So if you are not able to come to the museum, at least there was some way in which you could find um, almost solace or warmth or, or a visit uh, in the digital sphere. Uh, so our beautiful website uh, has an extensive education um, segment that was developed 
through our online teaching with schools such as South Peninsula. Um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit about what we've managed um, to do within the past year. So uh, as we said um, previously, you know, um, from your basic, basic first time learner who's never seen an artwork in real life before, never been asked to respond to an artwork, how do we incite observations? How do we encourage um, young people? Uh, and I say young, I'm talking about being young into the, the field of art and art industry. How do we encourage them uh, to state or clearly offer observations? But then also, once we've reached that point, how do we emphasize the importance of research-based work? Um, and with that, what we've done um, over the past year is then to develop two modules. Uh, the first module, um, which is about just how to analyze an unseen artwork, is uh, quite extensive in its own right. And what's the lovely thing about this is that using Ermiston's artwork, um, the expressive and gestural qualities of, of the content and the way the materials are used um, really does incite observations from young people and automatically uh, because of the emotive reaction um, to these artworks and especially the portraits, uh, they do really serve as a good tool to get conversations going. Um, and the kind of material that we've developed here is, is tends to be quite personable. Uh, we have introductions um, from uh, our facilitators uh, on, the, on the staff. Uh, we have discussions, videos, etc. cetera, um, some fun activities to do. Uh, and all these exercises do is try and draw on the lived experience um, of the participants that um, engage in our online classes. And of course, uh, these are not only geared at single uh, individual viewers who would like to learn more, but also largely towards teachers who really need these resources in the classroom. Um, so our second um, module uh, takes things one step further. So in these exercises and in this module, um, we not only draw on our own experiences, but you are expected to do a little bit more reading, a little bit more observation, a little bit more study, a bit more research in order to compare and contextualize artworks. Um, but the aims that um, we are slowly trying to develop and encourage more informed opinions, a deeper understanding, a deeper awareness, um, not only of the artworks, but also of the world we live in. And to this end, um, once again, uh, a very warm welcome uh, setting of the scene by one of our facilitators. Um, and then looking at the large question, which is what is art? How did Irma find her way um, through this ever-changing art world? Uh, what is art industry in Cape Town and how are we finding and navigating our way through these spaces? So we've developed videos um, that discuss art um, as a Western art form. How did art in galleries and museums happen? Uh, the start of art in South Africa, uh, looking at uh, the political climate, the political world, um, and then art's role in shaping society. Um, not only in shaping a free society, but also in shaping very much a colonial society. Uh, also very important for us is to not only make it just about Irma, but make it about how she navigated her way through life and how she used art as a tool um, for herself in, as a woman, um, as a Jewish woman, as someone who was constantly moving from space to space, uh, whose life was dictated to by trauma and war. Um, and how she elevated herself using her sensibilities um, through art, but also how other artists within the same period um, were using art as a tool uh, to mediate life. So uh, thank you to the Noble Foundation also through our partnerships with them and the Gerard Sakato Foundation, um, uh, working across uh, museums to, to really look at how um, we could really compare and start difficult discussions and conversations around 
artists and how they uh, navigate their lives. Um, there are also many, many other uh, little bits and pieces that are very integral to this kind of work and this kind of um, education opportunities for teachers and students. So um, there are very short and concise notes um, around how to contextualize artworks, how to compare artworks, uh, etc. Uh, and um, we try and keep it short, sharp. We don't want to waste anyone's time. People need to spend their time looking and thinking and making. Um, so please have a look at that. And I'm sure you'll enjoy that very much. Now, besides our school-based work, um, we also uh, very much, when we are looking at our digital presence, um, uh, we work quite hard on our Instagram uh, things, um, posts in the past year. Uh, trying to encourage people to just look at the artworks a little bit longer, uh, look at them a little bit differently, um, et cetera. Uh, let's see. I'm going to... Um, yeah. I'm trying to get to the top of this page, but I guess I'm going to have to go a little bit further down. Um, so there are lots and lots of other uh, videos that we have produced. I'm going to encourage you to have a look at um, some of these. Maybe if I make it a bit smaller, there we go. Uh, we can have a look at some of the other videos that we've produced. Um, and of course, these have, have a fantastic response from people uh, because we're just taking that moment of looking at the painting and stretching it a little bit further. Um, but of course, now we're, we're back in 2021 and our doors are once again open. Um, and while we've spent the past year um, developing materials uh, and really looking at reframing um, curriculums and reframing the way we understand uh, the museum to function uh, within a post-COVID um, society, um, we realize that the power of the museum site, you know, the presence of a curated tactile collection and human interaction uh, is where the potent learning really takes place. So uh, since we have been able to welcome visitors back to Irma's house this year, the museum has had a sense of returning to a real human social space, which is inclusive and welcoming and accessible to a transforming community of existing and potential art lovers. Um, we've also focused this year largely on teacher training, providing an immersive experience for educators who are keen to develop themselves and their learners and their schools in creative and critical ways. Um, quite alarming uh, to me this year, especially was with amongst all the teachers that we've, we've dealt with and we have dealt with many, is that out of each group, perhaps only one or two people have ever visited a museum um, and a handful have ever visited the Ermister Museum. Um, and with thinking about that and thinking about where our teachers come from and what they actually can go back and do within classrooms, because not everyone's going to be able to afford a, a bus to bring their learners through. Not every teacher is going to be able to afford to come by um, once a week on their own steam, pay an entry fee, et cetera. Um, we have to look at how we can further develop our programming to make sure that we are keeping arts alive in schools. So for example, with our clay lessons, it's about how do you recycle the clay to use it again? How do we make sure that we have enough tactile um, activities in our classrooms to keep our fine motor skills to be developed? How do we ask the right questions to ensure that visual literacy um, is being developed? Um, we also look at different kinds of materials that teachers can use from making your own brushes, as you can see, uh, um, which can also function as, as fiber tip markers, using things like coffee, 
tea, etc., cetera, um, as inks and washes, um, how to prepare paper, um, newsprint, how to uh, take newspaper and work with that as a material. But of course, not as a second grade material, um, using it to its full aesthetic value. We even used um, watch feeding schemes used every day, which might be the only tactile material available to certain schools, which is your bread, peanut butter, and jam um, that learners get served to once a day. Um, lots of our learners in Cape Town, that's the only meal they get for the entire day. But to bring your art activities into that, and of course, here, peanut butter, butter, jam, create the most wonderful impasto textures. Um, and it becomes really, really fun. Plus, you begin to really appreciate um, what you have. Uh, and I might say the funnest part about creating these works is eating them because you never know where to start. Um, also quite important to us uh, this year, uh, through the wonderful donation um, and, and uh, funds made available by uh, Strauss uh, and co-auctioneers, um, was our teacher workshops. So we have, we have offered three um, Strauss workshops this year. And uh, the first one uh, was in, um, in March, and that one was for high school teachers, predominantly those who teach the specialist students from grade 10 to 12, um, rather in depth. Um, and here you can see the kind of things that we have to offer these teachers. Of course, most of them are not having actually encountered an original Stern before in their lives, but having to teach uh, what Stern's artwork was all about. I mean, these are the people we have to target uh, to get to our museum. Um, what we've done there is given teachers a wonderful resource pack, A1 size posters. Um, these posters are really large and they're of really good quality. Um, so someone sitting at the back of the classroom, um, whether there are 60 children in front of you, you know, in this space, um, these posters are large enough to really create a, a text and um, image rich classroom that perhaps will somehow feed their imagination and log somewhere in their brain. With our FET teachers, we try to have what we call lecker conversations. We sit on the stoop, we discuss curriculum, we discuss the framing of the curriculum, what we'd expected to teach learners and that how, how those outcomes that um, are set through the curriculum, how they really compare with what we expect learners to be able to do and know uh, and decide by the time they are done with, with the matric program. Uh, we look at, like I said previously, the emergence of a Cape Town art world. What is art society, you know? Uh, juxtaposing Irma's artworks uh, with works by traditional, modern, contemporary art. We look at other artists, other movements, all in an effort to equip learners and teachers with the skills to analyze artworks while covering curriculum content at the same time. Uh, because Irma greatly allows us to, to simultaneously investigate uh, trends in European modernism and the practice and production of visual art on our very continent, uh, be it modern, be it historic. So by exploring Irma's responses to the changing world around her, uh, in order to make sense of the changing world around us, you know, through employing our art senses as she did, by contributing to the creation of meaning. Uh, through Irma's journey, we can reflect on and explore the importance of creating an individual visual language and visual literacy skills, and the roles they play in decision-making. Not only decision-making in how am I going to produce this artwork, or how am I going to analyze this artwork, but also in life decision making, uh, being aware of all the options, the context in which you're operating. Um, and I mean, the great beauty about art for me is how art manifests ideas, it manifests the intangible. So those are the kind of decision making skills that we want to inculcate, develop and encourage with our school program. Um, and of course, uh, our second workshop, when we're dealing with grades six to nines, uh, we kind of went 50-50. 50% was looking at uh, discourse, conversations, visual analysis. But of course, the most, uh, the biggest joy, of course, is getting elbow deep into paint with teachers, especially teachers who really struggle within the classroom, with their workload, with um, classroom management and cleanliness. So people 
clearly don't paint in classes anymore. Um, and that is why these workshops are so important, you know, to keep painting alive in schools. Um, keep color, keep, keep that freedom of, of being able to make your own choices within one art lesson. Uh, and for that, I have to commend Strauss uh, for their wonderful donation to make these workshops possible. We've had the most fantastic feedback. Uh, we're going to have our last workshop on this Saturday coming up now. And uh, that workshop will be for teachers who teach in the earlier learning phases. So from grade R uh, up to grade, about grade six. Uh, and they of course will be not only elbows deep, I'm pretty sure neck deep in paint um, as we explore how to really push a few packets of uh, tempera paint um, through an entire term or an entire year looking at how we can print with it, how we can mix it with all different kinds of substrates uh, in order to change its performance and really keep kids excited and interesting, uh, interested. Um, and of course, uh, like we say, um, getting uh, building a future audience for our museum, for the work of Irma Stern, for the arts and art history um, in general. So once again, hats off to uh, Strauss for, for keeping painting alive in our schools and for our very, very brave teachers um, who have really stuck with these programs um, and who are implementing them in schools and changing little lives one by one. So with that, um, these are just some of the, the paintings that teachers have created uh, within our spaces and I'll hand over to Matthew.